Thank you very much for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here with you at the International Conference on Design Futures. I'm very happy uh, to be able to share with you some of the ideas and uh, challenges that we've been working on here at UNESCO and around the world with a whole network uh, of people that are thinking about futures literacy. This is a moment when, for many of us, it feels quite exceptional, quite uh, a serious moment in, in time and history when we're contemplating things like climate extinction, when the whole world is worrying about climate change, when a pandemic demonstrates to us, not only that, of course, we're all together in this on planet Earth, because we all experience what a small virus can do to everyone in the whole world right now, but it's also because these events, these emergent phenomena, where from one day to the next, many things change, these illustrate something very fundamental about our capacity to imagine the future. In all of these circumstances, one of the really crucial things, the thing that impacts on how we feel, on our hopes, our fears, on how we relate to each other, has to do with our images of the future. Where do those images of the future come from? Why do we have the image of the future in our head? What are we using those images for? Futures literacy is a capability. That's what the word literacy in English means. It's a capability. Being literate is being able to read and write. Futures literacy is being able to use the future to understand something that in, in some ways is technical, just the way reading and writing is technical. You have to learn the alphabet. You have to understand grammar and syntax. You have to practice. You have to read to be able to be literate. Futures literacy calls for the same type of development of a competency. It's a skill that you can reflect on, you can study, you can refine. But this is a skill which is related to a crucial aspect of the way in which we relate to the world around us. And that's why I think it's really something that's central to design thinking. The future offers us this way of connecting the present to what we care about. But that means it's also a constraint. If we only care about farming, let's say, because we think the future is just farming, then we'll only pay attention to what's relevant to farming. If you are preparing dinner and you have a specific recipe in mind, the other day, I made dinner for friends. And of course, I had to think about what I wanted to cook. And I didn't go to buy fish. I went to buy vegetables. It structures the way I act, what I see, what I pay attention to. That's how the future influences us. It's so deep. So when we begin to think about how the future can constrain, limit what we see, we can also begin to take on the challenge of how to use the future to expand and to enlarge what we see. This calls into question the issue of certainty, the question of novelty, the relationship that we have to surprises. In other words, what opens, what expands what we can see? It's our ability and willingness, our confidence to make sense and to sense difference. Things that are not repeating. Things that are not just always the same. So, futures literacy is this capacity to understand the powerful role that the future plays in what we perceive right now. The ability to connect to futures literacy, the ability to make sense of it, is something that is not really that difficult. When it's time to explain to a child why they need to learn to read and write, you say to them, look, you're talking, you're speaking. Well, what's written down is what you're saying. And you can read something that somebody else wrote or said because they put it in writing. 
And the fact that we have language gives us a logical connection to enhancing or augmenting our ability to speak. Futures literacy is exactly the same. We use the future all the time and we can become more aware of why we're using the future and how we're using the future. Think about it. Where do the images of the future come from? The images that you use to think about your own future, to think about the future of the community and the people around you. Where do those images come from? Were they something that you dreamt up? Probably not. Most of us use images of the future that come from sources outside us. Sometimes they're historical sources, sometimes they're popular culture sources. They come from all around us. Those images, they're crucial components of orienting our choices in the present. What if we were able to source those images from our own context? If we became better able to develop our own images of the future. This is like teaching somebody how to write. They don't just read what somebody else has written, but they're able to write themselves. Or they don't just listen when somebody reads to them, but they can actually read for themselves and choose what they're going to read. In the same way futures literacy speaks to this inherent capability to use our imagination to describe and invent the future. Now, one of the really crucial characteristics, one of the big differences in a sense, between reading and writing and imagining the future is that when you read or write something, you know, it's in front of you. You can touch it. It's there. The future, there is no evidence from the future. There is no data. So it's a question of training and developing our imagination. That's something we can design. So here at UNESCO, we've been designing, co-designing, Futures Literacy Laboratories. Those laboratories enable people to experience, to have a, a tangible uh, sense of where they're sourcing their images of the future. They have a tangible experience with inventing their own assumptions that help them to describe imaginary futures. By doing that, gradually, we become more aware of how we can source the future from our own context, from our own experience. As we do that, we open up the ability to let go. We enhance our ability to let go of futures that are just based on the past. It, it's, it's, it's normal. Once you become better able to do something, you can do it in ways that you couldn't do before. And so this openness of the future actually has a huge impact on the relationship that we have, the, 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 the sense that we get of uncertainty, novelty, things that have no name but exist in the world around us and could have potential that if we're limited in the way we think about the future, become incomprehensible. Just last week, we were in Berlin at the World Future Studies Federation Conference. And as part of that, the lead up, we, run, we ran a futures literacy laboratory on the future of Berlin. During that lab, participants were invited on the basis of a very careful co-design to create situations where the participants could improvise, where they were obliged, because they'd been denied certain past points of reference, to invent new points of reference. This is a creative act. This is what designers and artists, but all humans, do all the time. We are creative. We invent things. We try to give names to things that we have not encountered. This is our ability to recognize and make sense of difference, to go beyond just repetition, to incorporate novelty. We have no choice but to do that. The only certainty is uncertainty. And in the lab in Berlin, the participants imagined the spirit of Berlin without the city of Berlin. They tried, in what we call a reframing, to think about what it might mean to abstract, to go beyond, to let go of the past, 
the city as concrete. And imagine the city as an idea that infuses a non-physical, a non-urban world. Nobody's saying that that's a good idea, that cities would disappear. Nobody's saying that it's likely to happen. But the point is, by experimenting with letting go of the past and going beyond projecting the past into the future, we're able to detect, give meaning to aspects of the world around us that would otherwise seem irrelevant. It was a point I made right at the beginning. If you're only thinking about the future of X, let's say it's farming, let's say it's the future of an industrial society, you're only projecting the past into the future. This limits our ability to see the richness of the experimentation taking place around us all the time. And let me you know, connect this up to design thinking. The design thinking process so often, and, and, and particularly in its uh, contributions in the last decades, has been about how do we tap into other people's perceptions? How do we diversify the sources of inspiration, which are crucial uh, to inventiveness and creativity? Well, that applies not just to solving problems, because the problem has already defined the issue, but it's to inventing new problems, to understanding problems that we never had because we didn't, the world is, changes and we didn't understand those problems. So inventing and, and detecting new aspects of the world around us necessitates letting go of the past. And this means that we have to become better at anticipation, what we call anticipation for emergence. The contradiction, in the sense just definitional, between improvisation and planning, planning is not improvisation, improvisation is not planning, does not mean that there's a close relationship between the two. There is. And that's what futures literacy about, is about. It's about preparing us to be more emergent preparing us to have the ability, the confidence, the, the, the experience with standing back, letting go, being humble about the world around us and about the future. The last few centuries have been a lot about design, a lot about engineering, a lot about constructing the world around us. And that has some downsides. It puts us in a position where we think we have to command and control and determine the future. In fact, that creates a huge amount of anxiety because the one thing that's certain is that change will happen. How can we incorporate that into our way of thinking? By becoming simply better at designing from the perspective of planning? I don't think so. I think the, one of the crucial insights of things like speculative design, the insight of putting together artistic, which is usually considered open, in other words, artists, artists have the right, artists are expected to be inspired by who knows what. Who knows what inspired them? But that's something that actually can be part of what everybody does, including designers. It's not just designing a better world on the basis of what we have today, but being able to imagine a different world where there's changes in the conditions of change. Changes in the conditions of change might sound mysterious, but we've all experienced it all the time. When you live in a world where nobody has a cell phone, and then you live in a world where everybody has a cell phone, you've experienced changes in the conditions of change. New things are possible. That's the same point about when a society becomes literate, able to read and write. You can think about newspapers, think about uh, instructions, think about plans. All of those depend on people being able to read and write. There's a precondition. We plan to create capability. We plan to create openness. But like with reading and writing, you don't know exactly what people will do with that. When it's a capability-based approach to development, you don't determine and advance the goals. You allow the goals to emerge. And that way, 
you can take advantage of the dominant and inescapable aspect of the world around us, which is creativity, which is uncertainty, which is surprise. And then that surprise becomes a resource. It becomes a source of inspiration. It helps us to actually use difference, the difference that exists from moment to moment, more effectively. And to incorporate that difference into a, a way of being more at ease with not controlling the future, not colonizing tomorrow, not imposing our ideas of the past on the future. This less arrogant point of view, this more playful perspective, this more uh, design from the perspective of opening design to inspiration and art, this is all part, I think, of the transition that we're involved in today. Because the world is telling us, our planet is telling us, that our, I, the idea that we can control tomorrow, that we have to kill uncertainty, uh, puts humans in a position where, in fact, we're not in harmony with, with the world around us. This has psychological impact because we have, we, we're, we're anxious. If somebody tells you, I'll control your future, everything's fine, don't worry, even if you believe them, in the back of your mind you know that there will be changes, uncertainty, that this is not possible. We set ourselves up. We create the conditions of our own nervousness, our own anxiety, and our own worry because we overstep. We put ourselves in a position of trying to be superior. That's not a necessity. And in that sense, design futures, to me, are not about simply improving the existing world and making everything better. It's really about changing and opening us up to the unknown, to allowing us to be more comfortable with not knowing. Because by not knowing, we actually put our ability to learn to better use. What's the point of being able to learn new things, to be able to change your mind, to be able to invent and imagine the world in different ways, if you're not open to that, if you think that you can know everything in advance and control the future. So I hope that, that the work that we're all doing together, that this international conference is all about, will allow us to diffuse and to collaborate in advancing our ability to use the future to create futures literacy for everybody. Because the future is so central. Every person is using the future all the time. And just like everybody can use language and we can augment our ability to speak through reading and writing, we can augment our ability to use the future through futures literacy. UNESCO, the network that we have, the Global Futures Literacy Network, the World Future Studies Federation, the UNESCO chairs that we've established around the world, we're all working to understand better human anticipation and put that capability to work in understanding the richness, the beauty, the mystery, the openness of the world around us. And I'll end by saying that I think that in the context of a pandemic, in the context of climate extinction, this is also potentially, and here I'm being speculative, a way to think about resilience. Resilience can be something that we pursue by creating castles, walls, building them thicker and thicker and protecting ourselves and saying we're resilient because we've thought of every contingency. We're prepared for any catastrophe. But there's another approach to resilience, which is diversification, which is experimentation. And it's a simple lesson from finance. You can put all your money on one horse or put all your eggs in one basket or you can diversify. And for humanity to be able to be more effective, more able to diversify, we must be able to appreciate difference, to make sense of novelty. And by making sense of novelty, it's not just a question of saying, oh yeah, I'm going I'm to just add it to what I already know. Sometimes it really means that we have to think about things in completely different ways. The transitions that have occurred in human history are examples of that. The move from peasant society to industrial society. 
change the way people think, change the way people relate to each other, were fundamental paradigmatic shifts from thinking of the world as flat to thinking of the world as round. It changes what we fear, it changes what we hope for, it changes what we see. So I believe that we're currently at a moment where design thinking and design futures are not simply about setting a goal and achieving a better world, but really about enabling humanity to take advantage of our underlying capability, our ability to imagine the future and to bring the future into the present through our imagination and use that ability for different reasons in different ways that make us more able to appreciate difference, to appreciate surprises, to be inspired by change and to create a relationship between us and all of the things that surround us, the animals, the, the, the forests, the planet, a relationship which is based on us being part of all of that. We're just a part of this world. And in that sense, we are able to evolve and to invent and to adapt and to aspire in ways that are not dominant, superior, crushing the world around us and ignoring the impact that we have on the world around us, rather incorporating that into the way we think, into the way we are, and living in a way that respects and honors the beauty and potential of life. Thank you very much. I hope you have a very good conference.